Hello folks. Today we're going to look at the encoding of analog signals into a digital format. Specifically pulse code modulation. We're going to be looking at Shannon's sampling theorem. So let's begin with a nice analog waveform. We'll start with a simple sine wave expressed in time. So let's just pretend that's a nice looking sine wave. If we were to plot this in the frequency domain, we would just get a simple spike at whatever this frequency is. Amplitude, of course, would correspond to this peak amplitude. Now, let's take a look at some trig. This will be of good use to us. If we took sine A and we multiply it by sine B, in other words, two different frequency sine waves at A and B. This trig identity says that that product is equal to one half the cosine of A minus B minus the cosine of A plus B. All right. That looks all well and good. What does it actually look like when we multiply the two of them? Well, we would start with something like this. So let's just say we have these two different frequencies, right? We'll call this one A, call that one B. When I multiply them together, Ignoring the amplitudes for just a sec, right, we have A minus B and A plus B as the resulting signals. So if we were to look at A, I'll just put this in like a little dotted thing here. For reference, there's A. Now B's over here somewhere. What we wind up with is these two new frequencies at A plus B and at A minus B. Okay, this might be familiar if you've studied um, communications. This is essentially dual sideband suppressed carrier AM. That's really what we're describing here. And this turns out to be extraordinarily useful looking at our uh, digitization. Because what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply the sine wave by another waveform, kind of a unique waveform. It is, in fact, just a series of pulses. Essentially, it looks like this. We just refer to these as unity amplitude pulses. Ideally, they're infinitely thin, but they have a certain spacing, right? The rate at which they reappear we'll call Fs, the sampling frequency. Now, if I look at this in terms of its spectrum, Again, like I did above, we have a pretty interesting spectrum. This has a DC offset, so there's a thing over here at zero. And then we see spikes working their way up. So there is one at FS. I'll just call it F here. One at two times that, one at three times that, four times that, five times that and so on and so forth. All right, so in other words, integer multiples. It's kind of interesting that the frequency domain representation sort of looks kind of like the time domain representation, sort of coincidental. But in any case, we just think of this as um, a pulse of unit amplitude everywhere else it's zero, right? Wherever there's a pulse, we think of that as one and all the spaces in between we think of zero. So if I multiply these two things in time, what we get is something kind of interesting. I'm going to draw a new waveform because we're not going to look at just a uh, plain old sine wave here, right? Um, what we're going to wind up with in this case, you could think of these various frequencies
as being one of these guys and this one being the other. In other words, we can see, it, see this as a series. What we're going to wind up with is this frequency on either side, in other words, the A minus B, A plus B, of each one of these. That's what the resulting spectrum is going to look like. So if we took a sort of an interesting waveform, you know, like a, um, a voice waveform or something, I'll just draw something kind of simple here like this. It's not a pure sine wave. And I multiply at this rate. So I'm going to scale these together, right? So sort of superimpose this on top of here. And what do you get? Well, this is unity. So unity times zero is zero. And then this is unity. That's going to give me this value. And this, same thing. All of these other spaces in between, of course, are zero. So we wind up with this sort of red version of the waveform. Samples of the original waveform, right? And you could kind of think of this in a sort of a connect the dots kind of version. Now superficially, you could kind of look at it like this. You have all these little measurements. And you could just sort of, you know, by eye, just kind of connect the dots here, and you would get back your original waveform, all right? But there's actually a lot more to it than just that. Because if we look at the spectrum, this is the interesting bit, right? If the original spectrum, I have this funky looking waveform, um, just to keep it easy, I'm going to draw a shape in here because, you know, if this is like a voice waveform or a musical instrument, it has lots and lots of harmonics on it. So maybe that looks something like this. In other words, there's all of these different frequencies in here. And it goes to some upper frequency limit, right? And audio, you can hear up to maybe 20 kilohertz if you have good hearing, the unhealthy person. Uh, when I do this multiply, each one of these individual frequencies in here is treated the way B is treated over here. In other words, A are these individual frequencies that I have from the pulses, and B are the individual frequency components of the waveform. So what we wind up with is a spectrum. I'm going to have to stretch this out a little bit. That kind of looks like this, right? The DC offset actually gives me the original spectrum. And then I see sort of copies of it, right? So up here, I'm going to say that's where F is. In other words, FS. I'm going to see the plus and minus of that. So here's the plus bit. There's the minus bit. And then up here, this would be 2FS. And we're going to see the same thing. And this is just going to keep replicating, right? For every one of these, it's like we're going to see these little things off on the side, right? Off we go. Well, the interesting thing is, you know, this resulting waveform, which is just all of these red spikes that I've got here, contains the original information. In other words, this stuff, that's the original stuff. And then all of this extra new stuff, right? all of these way higher frequency components. So I can extract, if you will, the original information just by using a low pass filter. That's what I'm describing with this red thing. If I just use a low pass filter, we're gonna get rid of all of this high frequency stuff and we'll essentially recreate the original waveform. In other words, the sort of green sketch that I have here, okay? Now the red spikes, that's called PAM, which is pulse amplitude modulation. Okay, 
the next step is to take each one of these spikes and represent it as a number. That's called PCM, or pulse code modulation. Okay, so we basically have an amplitude here, and we turn that into a number. Crudely, you could imagine using a voltmeter and measuring it and saying, oh, it's uh, 1.037 volts. The next one is 0.962 volts, and the next one is you know, 0.8335 volts, and so on and so, so, so forth. Right? Crudely speaking, we'll take a closer look at that in just a sec. But before we do, there is a very important thing you have to notice here, and that is when I look at the spectrum, you have to be careful of one thing. This was the original spectrum, right? And here's my sampling frequency up here. I have to make sure that when I look at this reflection going down, right, here's the reflection going up, there has to be space in here. Otherwise, we're going to run into trouble. In other words, if my spectrum looks like this, but the FS was like down here somewhere, Right, those two things are going to kind of go like this. And we run into this problem right here, where these things overlap. If they overlap, then this simple filter can't work. Because if I try to filter this, we're going to get some of this reflected frequency content, right, from this sort of lower sideband, if you will, in the original signal. That's bad. That's called an alias. And unlike... Um, let's say clipping distortion, this is really high amplitude, it's not um, harmonically related, it's really glaring, ugly stuff. We don't want that at all. So what we need to make sure is that the highest frequency that we are going to sample, in other words, the F2 that we would use over here for my filter, okay, that thing can't be any more than half of the sampling frequency. Right, so to prevent aliasing, F2 has to be less than or equal to the sampling frequency divided by 2. Another way of looking at that is if you have a simple sine wave, you need at least two samples for every cycle. Okay? Practically speaking, you're going to need a little bit of space in here. Right? You don't have a perfect brick wall filter. So it, practically speaking, it's going to have to be a little bit beyond that. All right. Anyway, back to our PCM. We're going to take this measurement, this value, and turn it into a digital number. We're going to turn it into binary, right? Weighted binary. And there's a very important characteristic here, and that's the resolution. What's the bit resolution on here? How many bits am I going to use to describe the signal? It's not infinite, okay? So, for example, if I have an 8-bit coding, if I'm going to use a single byte, 2 to the 8th gives us 256 possible values. In other words, from 0 to 255. If I go to 10-bit coding, it'll be 1,024. Right. The more bits I get, the more possible values I have. So you could think of, of sort of taking the measurement and sort of dividing it up. In other words, how many levels do I want to have? Right? Well, sharpen it up, put more in there, right? Use more bits, these steps are smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. If I use 8 bits, there's 256 steps. If I use 16 bits, there's over 65,000 individual steps. And each one of those little steps, the difference between it and the real live signal represents an error, it represents noise. So the more bits I use, the lower the theoretical noise floor is. As a matter of fact, each bit is approximately equal to 6 dB of dynamic range. Okay, so an 8-bit system is about 48 dB. A 16-bit system would be about 96 dB. 
It is, in fact, just a little bit more than that, but that's a good approximation. Okay? So the more bits you have, theoretically, the lower the noise floor can be. So let's take a look at a couple of quick examples here. Right? So if I was to do a standard telephone voice channel, right? Um, the F2 on this would probably be around 3.5 kilohertz. And a phone is not really high quality audio. Um, so we would do a sampling frequency of about 8 kilohertz. And, you know, we're not looking for super hi-fi here, so the resolution might be 8 bits. That's, you know, more than sufficient. If you multiply this out, in other words, you're going to take 8,000 measurements, 8,000 samples every second. Each one of those things is 8 bits. Right? So in one second, you're going to multiply 8 bits times 8,000. Okay. And you're going to end up with 64,000 bits per second. That's referred to as a voice channel. That's a standard voice channel, 64K uh, bits per second. Compare that to um, stereo CD audio. All right, so that uses 16-bit resolution. Of course, it also has two channels, it's stereo. And the sampling frequency is 44.1 kilohertz. Now, if you multiply that out, Okay, so if you say, um, I have 16 bits per measurement, per sample. I have 44,100 of those samples per second. And we also, by the way, have two channels. You multiply this whole thing out, and you're looking at approximately 1.41 megabits per second. Right, so there's a considerable difference between these two things. Right? Finally, you could say, well, instead of looking at the transmission bandwidth and bits per second, you could think in terms of total storage. Like if you said, oh, I have a five-minute song. How many bytes does it take to store that? Well, a five-minute song is 600 seconds worth of music, right? Two channels is a total of 10 minutes, 60 seconds per, so that's 600 seconds. Now, 16 bits is two bytes. And you're doing 44,100 of these every second. So you multiply this all up. And you get approximately 52.9 megabytes. That's what it takes to store your five-minute song if it's uncompressed. If we put it into an MP3 or something like that, there's a compression algorithm that'll shrink that down. But that would be an uncompressed raw PCM file. So now the next thing we need to do is figure out, well, this is all fine, well, and dandy, how do we implement it? How do I make a circuit that will you know, take these pulses and measure them, turn them into a number? How do I make a circuit that, you know, given this number, given a binary value like 00111010, turns it into an amplitude? And we stitch it all together and get back our original waveform. That's what we look at in the upcoming videos.